When were you born, John? On May 12, 1926. And you were born in Akron, right? Akron, Ohio. Okay. And you were telling me, because um, you enlisted in the Marines, you want to tell me that story because you told me you enlisted underage like so yeah, many did. I, did. I went to, at 16 years old, I used my regular birth certificate. So, because you had to be 16 to enlist. So I went and enlisted, but you had to be 17 to go in to serve. So I went down, took my birth certificate, I signed my dad's name to the enlistment. <clears throat> and so it's getting around where it's fairly close to time I'm going to have to go. I thought, well, I'm going to have to tell my dad. So I went and told my dad I had enlisted. Signed his name. Well, he was going to stop it at first, uh, which he could have done. Right. And uh, but he went in and talked to our pastor first. And our pastor said, "You know, at his age, he's not far from being drafted." And he said, "How would you feel? If you stopped him from doing something he wanted to do, and he got drafted." <laughs> Skill. Well, that shit my dad up so bad that he didn't want to have that decision on his conscience, so he just let it go on through. So, I mean, why did you choose the Marines? Well, it was every young kid back then. It was World War II. Or, you know, all the movies were showing the Marines charging up the hill. and So that was just, that was a 16 year old's dream. <laughs> Okay, one that you knew you didn't know anybody in the Marine Corps. I didn't know anyone in the Marine Corps. I just knew they were rough. They were tough. And, you know, the movies were all about Marines, so. Right. So then you went to San Diego? Yeah, I went to San do? Diego Boot Camp. Okay. And we shipped over to these. Uh, back to, you know, what they wanted was warm bodies overseas at that point, anyway. Right. And, uh, so I went straight across the Pacific into Okinawa, and then I was one of the first group that flew into Japan after the surrender. And we set up the, the Yakuza Japan, we set up the garden perimeter in there, because I said, uh, we were uh, trained to, for guards around the air. So every place we went, there was an air port. Okay. And uh, so that was mostly what I was on the whole time of the war. Were you in the fleet wing? Is that what I remember? Yeah, it's called Fleet Marines. Is what okay. it is. And the Fleet Marines was just simply, that's what it was, a group that could go in anywhere. If there was an airport and they were going to invade that particular island, we would go in, we would be trained to set up and protect that air base. What was the hardest thing for boot camp for uh, you? You know, boot camp was hard all the way through. It was eight weeks back then. And I can tell you, it was the hardest eight weeks I've ever spent in my life. I mean, it was uh, brutal from morning till night. I had I didn't shave back then. Okay. So they came in the first morning for inspection. Now, the boot camp was set up that the first drill instructors you had, it was an eight-week thing back then, but the first drill instructors were these massive brutes. I mean, they were huge. Because uh, we'd be out marching and someone would make a mistake, they'd run up, grab a guy by the shoulders, and pick him up like a child and shake him. They were that big. And so, first day in there, the, we had the inspection. And this big sergeant says, You better stand a little closer to your razor next time, Wilson. I said, I don't shave, sir. <laughs> Which I did, but I never shaved up right. then. He says, you're going to shave from now on every day, and I'm going to check you close to make sure you have. So I did. I, I shaved real close from now on. Was that the first time you'd been away from home? Oh, yeah. yeah. We, we, we were uh, born in Akron and uh, went to Coventry High School out there. It was... Uh, I was just getting tired of high school at the time that I went down and decided to become a Marine. And of course, I saw a movie with the, the Marines kept charging in. And uh, other than that, it was 
normal life, good family. Right. So they take you. So they took you by boat. I'm assume from San Diego. Yeah, what, to... what we did, they uh, okay. we went by train from Cleveland, and my parents uh, decided they would drive me to Chicago so they could spend a little more time with me. I got on the train in Chicago to go on out to San Diego for boot camp. Right. And as soon as boot camp was over, we went up to Miramar, where we were trained for the airport. Uh, type guard duty. And uh, from that, it went back to San Diego and shipped overseas. So, did you ship from there to Guam or over there? We shipped over there and went to Kwajalein. Okay. Uh, Guam hadn't even been invaded at that point. So, I went to Kwajalein and uh, we were there for, oh, Quite a while before we should, then we transferred on to Guam, went by carrier uh, to Guam. And I loved that carrier life because they had full basketball courts on them for the carriers. And uh, then in Guam, which was part of one of the stories that, that she told you, uh, there were two prisoners, Japanese prisoners. Up, we were up on top of a cliff, no. and we what we'd have to do is dig our latrines quite a bit away from our because of the snipers and such, and we'd have a wire that would lead out to the latrine. Right. And the Japanese and we would throw and we would eat. We would throw our garbage over this cliff. And the Japanese were at that point they were bypassed, and uh, they would sneak in and try to get our garbage. To have something to eat was that they were that. In fact, one, if you remember, uh, forty years after the war, he surrendered and didn't know the war was over yet. Yeah. So it was that type of uh, Guam was. Uh, uh, this was in Okinawa. That was Guam. I'm talking about now. It was really one of the biggest jungles you've ever seen, and the ones that used to feed me would. The Japanese would sneak in trying to get our garbage down at the bottom of this cliff. And some of these young kids, if they were coming in, they wanted to shoot a Japanese. And they'd come up there and lay up on that edge of that cliff, waiting for one of the Japanese to commit to get something to eat so they could shoot one of them. And it would anger me at, at those guys. Uh, it was just, you know, it was just the wrong thing to do. Right. So you're on Guam for about how long, would you say? Well, generally, you weren't on any of the island very long. Uh, it was, as an example, as on Kwajalein, was the first, went to Majuro and a, you know, a couple of the islands out there. Kwajalein was the first major, even though it was a massive island that had an airport on it. Because if you know, during World War II, all the islands they hit, anything that was long enough to have an airfield on it had one. Right. And that was where all the invasions were. There weren't all these other jungles and uh, such. Guam even had a big naval port, but not an airfield. Right. So uh, it's that huge island, and that's where all these Japanese were bypassed in there, were even starving to death or got tired of eating grass and whatever was down there. And uh, it was just, it was one of the most, most like West Virginia. If you get into the worst of West Virginia, that describes how Guam is all over. Okay. You know, hills, cliffs, and right. cutoffs. And as an example, when I had, it was one of these old uh, Marines, with Master Gary, sorry. His name was Dean. And he used to always tell me the pirates he got with Master Gunnery Sergeant. He'd been in it all his life in the Marine Corps. And he used to tell all of us that what he was going to do, he carried a can of gasoline with him all the time. And he says, I catch any of you asleep on the post. I'm going to pour gasoline on you and set you on fire. 
Then when you run to the ocean to put it out, I'm going to get you for being off the guard duty in Florida. Oh, my God. That was... <laughs> yeah, wow. I'm going to tell you a little story about me. And we were... Let's see. It was our... Project Line. Uh, and Project Line, the invasion, the whole strip of the island was... You know, the airport goes through the center. You had a roadway that went all the way around in a camp area up near the, the western, eastern side of the island. And the special orders were that if from anything you saw, anything arriving from the beach, any move from the beach, to fire your rifle three shots. That's going to warn them that there's an invasion potentially. Well, there used to be these big rats down here. They were like cats. They were so huge. And I stand there and shoot at those things all night long. And nobody ever heard of <laughs> up there. And Guillen, one time, out of all the landing barges from the invasion were lined, were just cluttered. All of the long roadway was just cluttered with those. So I'm on guard duty one evening down at the end of the beach. We had special orders. And if you were to allow nothing whatsoever to uh, divert your attention from the beach. So I was leaning against the logs that were the big palm logs that built the machine gun launch. And I'm leaning against one side of it. And then every time a plane would come in, they would throw their lights on and it would light up, of course, the whole area. So I'm standing there one time and I'm looking at my reflection when the lights came on on the other side of the machine gun watch. And I see two heads there. They moved by, the other one didn't move. So I whirl around and here's Keen. Now remember we're talking this is a good mile from the living quarter back to where we were, all along this littered up beach with all these busted up uh, landing uh, equipment. <coughs> So when I whirled around, uh, he's right there behind me. And he said, uh, I could have had you, Wilson. I said, Gene, if I hadn't recognized you, you'd be dead right now. <laughs> and that was, of course, that was the way. He so he had the corporal of the guard. Before he came down, he crawled down. This is a good mile of these old busted up landing bar. He crawled all the way down there on his hands and knees. He told the corporal of the guard how much time he wanted to wait until I got down, until it would give him the chance to get down there. So the corporal of the guard, here he comes driving down. He's ready to relieve me, which he did, ran me up for not being alert on guard duty. And uh, when I went in to the uh, colonel, and I told him, <coughs> reminded him of special orders to allow nothing to, put every, <coughs> to divert your attention from the beach. And uh, I said, if I look for some gook every time I'm climbing down there and crawling in between there, I would never be able to look at the beach. He said, do you understand we have, of course, everyone knew he was a screwball. <laughs> He'd been, that's all he ever done to the Marine Corps, but and we got Master Gunnery Sergeant, they got tired of not promoting. <laughs> and uh, so he said, well, you know, there's special circumstances here. So under the circumstances, I don't expect to see you in here one more time. In other words, you make sure you are alert, doing everything you're supposed to be doing. Don't give him any excuses. <laughs> Because if it comes in, it's going to be hard on you. Yeah. Wow. So I went out of there. I called all the guards. Like the dean was there. I called them all over. I said, I want you guys to listen to me very carefully. When I'm on guard duty, if one of you sneaks up at me on my guard post, I'm going to shoot you first because I'll consider it a hostile act. And I'm going to find out who you are after. I made it really clear, made it sure, loud that everybody in that area heard. 
But from then on, when Gene would ever approach me, he would start whistling. <laughs> Maybe 200, 300 yards away and coming up on me at guard books. He fits that problem. Yep, that solved that one. <laughs> <coughs> but that was, that's actually what it was all about because I was weren't that big. You didn't have, you know, they'd be maybe a mile or two long and kind of narrow so the landing strip would uh, fit on me. And those are the only items we went after. The invasion were only those that would support an air. So were you getting ready for the invasion of Japan when yeah, they dropped well, we the bombs? Were, yeah, we were all the invasion of Japan had been set for quite some time. Uh, the Japanese, the island of Japan, <coughs> was uh, fairly light, though most of the islands around, except it would just happen to be bigger. And uh, the Japanese people were the friendliest people in the world. I mean, I used to go in and say, because I was on guard duty, I could go out there time I wanted. There were families I spent time out there, spent nights in their homes. Uh, they were very interesting. They were very loving. And uh, I used to, of course, when you're in the Marine Corps, I never cussed. Uh, in fact, I don't cuss now. But back then, the Marine Corps, by the time you're out of boot camp, there isn't any thing. You know, it's not a piece of bread if you have right. bread, it's F and this, F and that. So I remember I met with this one fan that was so, so nice that spent a lot of time. In fact, he won a medal in the Olympics. And he gave me that medal, which my son Steve, who was also a Marine, uh, has now. And the only thing I had was a silver dollar that I carried with me the whole time. And I gave that to him. Uh, and we would sit there, the Japanese homes had no furniture in them. And in the middle of the house, the houses themselves, I don't know if you ever did in Japan, but they were just uh, bamboo strips about that wide that separated with a row of paper each side. That was the wall, exterior wall of the house. No insulation whatsoever. So every of the Japanese homes would have a pit down the nugget in the center of the house. And they would get down in that and then blanket went over them. They had charcoal fires down there to keep it warm. So the families would really together put their time because they'd sit around that in that pit with the charcoal in to keep it warm. And the blankets would be up around the shoulders. And their beds they made were, they were really designed because they would build them up, you know, just in, with layers of that, those heavy uh, woven blanket type thing. Yeah. Build, actually build them up. The pillow was a round with a piece that had your scope top for your head. And you sat there, your head got locked into that and you didn't move. I mean, that was, you didn't turn around like we do on that. Right. And uh, I, as I say, I love the Japanese people. So one day I'm talking to this guy, and of course, at that time I was using the F word pretty good. And I told him, uh, tell him I said, uh, uh, Emperor, no F and good. Oh, no. <laughs> Emperor, very good, very good, very good. Don't you know F and good? <laughs> Because they all knew Tojo was the one that started right. all of the problems. Uh, but as it, I just love the Japanese people. That was the, did that surprise you? I mean, did, when you got to Japan? Oh, sure. I did. I figured that, uh, you know, they, they would be, because remember, we had about 30 miles from where we were on that base. We had dropped an atomic bomb and blew literally. Thousands of them. The smithereens. We were that close. So we were that close to where the base was. And uh, so I figured they would have, because I know if I was here with the military, they just blowing up everyone, you know, half of the city of Newark would blow it up with a, uh, a bomb that was dropped. Then they come in and 
ruling us around, I would be a little bit upset with them. But the Japanese people were not like that. And they did blame Tojo for the war. Uh, I love the Japanese people. How long, how long were you then in the occupation? I was there about a year, 11 months in fact. Because we flew in from Okinawa and flew into Yakuza band. In fact, that's this little chest over there I made when I was in Yakuza to keep things in. And uh, it was, uh, it was with guard, you know, it was on guard duty all the time. So we set up the perimeter around the airfield and everything. Uh, and it was just, at that point, we had a lot of liberty. I, because I could get out with the rest of them. Liberty was only noon till four in the afternoon because of the fear of, you know, the Japanese or some reprisal that they had initially when we got in. And uh, so, of course, with being on guard, kept, you know, I just went wherever I went. You know, just went out and stayed out all night. A lot of the Japanese families, and one family in particular, who I told you about, told you. Uh, so I didn't mind that occupation of them there 11 months after it went through from Okinawa after the war, right into Yakuza. We set up the perimeter around. <coughs> Yakuska was like, uh, the military base there was like two huge bases. One was totally abandoned. I mean, it had all the buildings, everything there. The other one was one where we had all the military people stay. Well, see, I was on the base because that was where the water chlorination was in. And uh, so I was able to kind of be charged with the water chlorination. So it was kind of a Good duty at that time because I could do just about what I want. Uh, but the Japanese people, as they say, were the friendliest there was. I never had any problems with any of the Japanese people. So, so was this close to Nagasaki or Hiroshima? Then? Well, Yokosuka uh, was down near the southern, the Honshu part. You know, right. Japan is in these big sections. And this was down here, the southern central part. And uh, as an example, the uh, here at Hiroshima, which is where they dropped the bomb, was only about 30 miles from where our base was. And that was the one I told you right in the middle of Japan. Did you visit there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I traveled all over Japan. Yeah. They have a railroad. That was <laughs> Japanese all traveled by railroad. It's, you know, it's kind of a hilly and not a good place to go on highway trips, okay. but it's the railroads controls everything. And I used to go in there and, as I said, met these families, I'd go and stay all night with them. So what was Hiroshima like to visit that? Well, that was one I never went to. Oh, okay. But uh, uh, it was Hiroshima, is what they probably okay. pronounced it. But, uh, there was so many just slaughtered there that uh, the you know the people I think were probably immobile in that city it was probably inactive much as a city for a long time until we got back on its feet again. Yeah. What was Okinawa like? Okinawa was really like a big old country inside. I'd watch like the Japanese. The natives there, were, they weren't Japanese, but the natives of Okinawa would travel in groups. And if there were women along where young, one of, a young girl was pregnant and her baby was about to be delivered, they'd stop along the side of the road, have the baby, rest, rest for maybe an hour, get up, they pick the baby up in the group and start on it. Oh my God. They were all farming communities. Right. And, uh, The natives weren't easy to, you know, first off, we didn't have any common language, but also they were kind of terrified of us at that time because right. the uh, Japanese went out, way out of their way to make Marines as murderous. In fact, when I first went into Japan, 
we went into the hospital. We were some nurses there. And the one asked, he says, who you, you kill, your mama or your papa? Because they've been told that in order to be a Marine, you had to kill either your mother or your father first. So you had to be that brutal. Lots of propaganda. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, they had to have them terrified of us because they were such a friendly group that if they weren't terrified of these white you know, they'd be too friendly with us. Did, did you stay in touch with any of the families after you left? No, because <laughs> the land, you know, I never learned to write Japanese. I, I had some addresses. I knew how to write my own name down. But uh, uh, the families there, just we wouldn't know how to write to them, you know. Just that we weren't there long enough to really get that kind of connected down that path. But I would have written to them lots of times if I, I'm, I think about the family that I stayed with the most over there a lot. The great people they really were. So the fellow that gave you his Olympic medal, what did he get that in? Do you, he was what games? Do you remember? It was running. I was running. Yeah, it was running. Because that's what you said, run, 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 you know, he's telling me about the devil when he battled with David. To him. Yeah. And uh, that's why I just gave him that silver dollar, which is the closest thing to what he had. Right. Uh, but I, I went to that, I spent a lot of nights in that family. So. And then you just were okay with you just coming in? Well, see, you make your bed up at night. Every night you have to get to bed, and they, the women make up the beds for you. Yeah. And they, they uh, I mean, other than that, the floor is just as like here. There's nothing on it. Right. You don't have chairs like this. Yeah. But you get that bad. So uh, they would make the bed, and it was done in form. In other words, they, they laid the first they had this mat up, which mattress is a blanket about that thick. They, they put that in. Right. Then you have that pillow, which is really, Solid, and it's got this place where your neck fits in, and so you don't turn over at night when you're sleeping in it. Right. And then they put your beds just mounted up on layers of these real thick blankets because there's nothing to keep the cold from coming in. It's the only exterior walls they ever had on those houses were these layers of bamboo about that thick and that paper mache type stuff on each side of it. That was the exterior of those houses, of all those Japanese houses. So when the war, or when your enlistment was over, did you think about re-enlisting? Or no, when the war was over, uh, I had eleven more months to go in Japan, and uh, I think everyone just wanted to get home. It was uh, we got in uh, on ships to go all the way back. You know, we got one ship we left there, we stayed in it all the way to San Diego. Uh, and I think just getting home was mostly what. Because once I went in, I didn't get home again. Right. I the boot camp leave, I was home like a day and a half. My family drove to Chicago, so we'd have a little bit more time together. And the train ride uh, back to San Diego and the rest, of, I was overseas real quick after boot camp. So, how old were you when you got out there? I was about 20. Well, I was 20. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was. I went in, was in 43 and 47. Yeah. Okay. And then, then did you finish high school when you got home? Well, what I did after I got home, I went to night high school. Okay. <coughs> Buddy Statman went to law school. Went to Case Western Reserve, got my law degree, and, uh, and went into business from that point. Chrysler Corporation, so I worked there most of the time. Okay. What? I mean, do you have a most memorable experience that you haven't told me about like, your time in the in the service? In the service? I'm I really can't think of anything that would be uh So exceptional, other than you know some of the brutality of of uh, what went on, 
and uh, the invasions when we would go in, uh, they're totally unlike what anyone thinks they are. You know, they're first they're drawn in a whole uh, area side. I told you how the, the landing bodies they come in in such mass that you're piled up on top of one another, and then the, the islands aren't that wide. So that really you have a close combat area, but if they collapse, the Japanese collapse real quick if they went in there. And uh, so the battles weren't long and drawn out battles like you would picture in some of these war scenes they have. Right. Uh, Guam was the most difficult. <clears throat> and Guam is the one where I told you the this we just went to a uh, anniversary thing for the Marine Corps birthday. <clears throat> I think maybe I told you about the guy that came up. And said his his dad and his uncle. He said I have. He was a Japanese ancestry, so his, his dad and his uncle were Japanese soldiers. And he, he was coming up talking to me, and uh, he said that I do have the. Said they killed a lot of my family. So he, apparently his family worked in Japan at that time, mostly in the military. Right. And uh, he said that they did save my dad and my uncle on Guam. This is what was so unusual that it occurred. I said, you know, I was on Guam. And there were two prisoners that were in it. All they had around them was chicken wire. It was built like about the size of a bedroom, right? Yeah, but just up high enough. I said there wasn't any guards on them. Mm -hmm. They didn't worry about them running away because they didn't want to go. I said, I went up one night, night and I was standing there and I was praying for them. And I said, I, they knew I couldn't understand what they were saying or they couldn't understand what I was saying. But they could tell by the way it was done that it was, I was praying for them. And he started to fall. And I think that uh, I didn't carry on. I'm sure, you know, I thought his, both of them were prisoners, so they were probably shipped back after the war. But uh, uh, what happened after that, I should have, if I could get over there again, we're going back this year, but certainly I'm still around. <laughs> I think you're still going to be around. You seem to be well, going to But I am going to try to get find out more of his dad and uncle. I'm sure they must have gotten back over there. Uh, Can I ask why were you, why were you praying with? I mean, just I was just because I'm a Christian, I guess. Okay. And there were <clears throat> there's two guys that are locked up in behind this chicken wire that can't and surrounded with people that they feel hate them. Right. You know? Want to cut their throat and do anything to them. And I so I just wanted to know that they were okay. And that's awesome. I mean, they, they took the time to do that. Well, it was when their when their son started bawling. Yeah. He, of course, he was a Marine at this time. But, uh, but uh, just to get that news. Because that, that I'm sorry I didn't follow up about did they get back in the same condition that I saw him in? Was that why he bawled, or was it just to know that when really they were looked after there? I, I mean, per, I think it's probably that they were that you took that time because, like, you know, a lot of Marines probably wouldn't have taken that time. Well, a lot of them did want to cut emblems off of their you know, right. at least. Uh, it's surprising how many felt they had to kill a Japanese. Even if it was uh, shooting one of those prisoners or going and stabbing one of those prisoners, and they put that chicken wire on them. It wasn't actually that they were afraid they were going to run away, but it was a perimeter that fell on the Marines, hands off these guys, they're prisoners. Right. 
Because otherwise, someone would have shot him. And with the, I mean, there was a United States propaganda at that time about the Japanese too. So I think some people might think, well, that you know that was cruel of those Marines, but I think they have to remember the time and you know what what was happening. You know? Well, and it was an attitude. See, a lot of these kids that went in, and look, I was only a kid. You know, I was seventeen years old, right. and uh, so a lot of them went in there with that. Hero attitude, you know, let's go and blow them up. And, and, uh, uh, and when I saw these guys laying up, this is on Guam now, when we were up on Guam, uh, the cliff, we were on top of the cliff. And at nighttime, we had to have a, to the latrines, they had to have your latrines way away from the sleeping area. Right. And then we'd set up, uh, there was a wire they would put out. And Stake it along and uh, leads you out to the latrine from your sleeping area. And it could be maybe a hundred yards away from where you were. Uh, but you had to follow that wire out of that. And uh, it was just totally different than people generally would have imagined. We had, uh, there was a, uh, you know, we always talked about. Uh, Officers that were gung ho in wartime was a big mistake. Uh, two things that happened when, to give you an example of how that really played out. On this one ship, they had the uh, commander of the ship was really a jerk, a gung ho. Wanted everyone to salute them and doing all of this. And at night, they would have these moves. And we'd all be you know, you'd have the, the center control section, and then all the rest of it would be open. And they'd set up that big camera film out there, and they had the, really the latest movies came on. So we're all out there watching, and I mean, you're jammed in. The ship is, you know, people out watching this movie. And this colonel always had a big overstuffed lounge chair. And he'd have them put out right where he could see the movie best, you know, the best position at the end there. Yeah. <laughs> so the movie is going on. The movie's over. They couldn't find the colonel. And actually, some Marines went in while the movie was on. They grabbed this colonel in his chair. They must have bustled him or somehow. But they took chair and all and threw it over here. Oh, out no. the middle of the ocean. Oh, that's an actual event. That happens. Did they find him? No hope. No, there was no point. There was no <laughs> way he would ever even oh, wow. figure out a way. Of course, he was probably well used up by the time they knew he was gone. Oh, my gosh. So that's what how they, you know, and again, it's wartime. Yeah. So these guys got pretty brutal some of them, especially when he was such a pain in the neck. Officers really tried to be very friendly with uh, the enlisted men for that very reason, because they don't blow your head off if you get too off much as well. Wow. So, you remember Pearl Harbor then, of course? Oh, yeah. Where, I mean, where were you when you heard about, I mean, you were what, probably? No, well, I was on, I was. 13 or 14? I don't know. I'd have been probably 16. Okay. When it wasn't long, you know, the war went up pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we lived in Akron, went to school, Coventry High School, out in the 40s Lakes. And uh, that was when the Pearl, when they dropped the atomic bomb on the Japanese. Uh, it was uh, near, you know, the war was over at that point. <coughs> But all the time up to then, uh, you didn't have that many years from the beginning, you know, the conflict until it was pretty well cleaned right. up. Uh, and it all, all of our experience, we were strictly on the islands. We, we went from San Diego and right straight across, and they were all just islands that weren't maybe a mile or two long and not too wide. Right. 
So when you heard about Pearl Harbor, I was a kid then, but see, that was, of course, that's when the movies came out right. and all of this stuff. That's what made me want to be a Marine. I know that uh, when that happened, you know, we were in the war, and then all the, of course, immediately the movies came out with these big war scenes and the combat areas and the heroics. And kids 16 years old, that was right down my alley. I was going to be a hero. And you came to Newark, did you tell me, about 1970? Yeah, it was right around 1970. And what brought you to Newark? Uh, well, let me see if I could. Well, it was the Ottawa. I was with Chrysler Corporation. I was. Uh, and I had a, uh, I was what they call the National Open Point Spaces. And what that meant was that where there was, they had determined they needed to have a dealership by the population and, and all, but the local zones were not able to locate a dealer or anyone able to make the investment to get in. <coughs> so Chrysler started a dealer enterprise there. And my job then was I was a national open point specialist, ideal job. So there'd be a place to be in Chicago if you can. <coughs> and they couldn't get a, one of those points closed. So I would drop, fly into Chicago, get a motel, and uh, then my job was to go around and call all, all the banks and the auto uh, de dealerships that were active there to find a guy with enough money or enough credit. Uh, that we could get him put in to a dealership. Okay. And usually we went after sales managers and people that were pretty experienced in the business. But I did that as a national, because some of those places were open points that were in good cities and they just could not get them closed for some reason. And that was my job, was to go in and do the impossible. And I, I was successful at it. And so that's what brought you to Newark. Coming yeah, in, in fact, that was, and uh, one day when we decided we, because we were living in New York at that time, so when we decided to come back to Newark, uh, my wife and I and my family we were in Akron. So we flew into Akron, and my wife and I got up in the car and just started driving around all over the eastern half of Ohio. To see some community that would we thought would be good to live in. And we toured all around up there that day. In fact, I remember uh, we would stop at this one restaurant to eat. And there was a guy hitchhiking out in front. And he came in and asked for a glass of water. And we were that's when we were having our meal together. He did it out hitchhiking when we first pulled in. So he came in and they, they gave him a glass of water. And he sat on the counter up there and he drank that glass of water like he would a cup of coffee. And you know, he sipped it, sat there, relaxed, and kind of, you know, tried to relax, but obviously wishing it was a cup of coffee. He just couldn't afford that. So I told my wife, I said, I'll tell you what, when we leave here, He's still out. I don't care where he's going. We're going to pick him up and take him to where he's going. <laughs> sure enough, he was still out there hitching away. So we stopped, picked him up, and we're driving along. He was telling me that up at, uh, around the Great Lakes, they were having these, uh, you know, they used to have these big. Parks, amusement parks, and things. Yeah. <coughs> He's going up there to try to get a job. Well, he hadn't gotten one. So now he's hitchhiking his way and trying to get back home. <coughs> well, it happened that his home was in Newark, Ohio. I didn't even know where Newark was. And here we are. Wow. So we picked him up, he's driving me on down. We go up to where his family was, and nobody was home. And he said, well, I can walk. I said, no, we're going to take you to where you're going. 
So we went down, found his other part of his family there, and they came out and they were hugging him, loving him up, you know, happy to see him. So I handed him a twenty dollar bill. And he was like, you talk about ball. Oh I mean he was really <clears throat> but for some reason, while we were driving around with him, uh, my wife at that time passed away a long time ago. We had two sons. But she uh, found this one house. Now, 79, as you know, is a main root house. Back then, it was just farmland out there right. you know, on all sides. Yeah. Well, this was right on the corner of Fields and Drive in Heath. And the 79 was just a country road with farm fields all over back around it. Well, as you know, the 79 then suddenly went up to where it all, we bought the house. It was already there, an existing house. And she had, she loved these big bricks. Like you see some of them by, you know, their fountain out here now. They, they, they made the, the old fashioned way, you know, where they're really they're big and kind of. So we built the chimney of, on the front of that house. It was a huge chimney, and we built one of those bricks. But she had picked that place out back when it was just countryside, but she liked that house. And the other the thing she really liked, though, <coughs> we had two boys. That, uh, one of them now is a college professor, and the other one is a attorney in town. But she wanted to leave. Heath High School was ranked in Ohio as the top high school in the state back then. Okay. And that's where she was. And she picked up this old country home right on the corner. And the school was just down where the boys could walk to school every day, the high school. And uh, that's how we happened to have that property. Well, of course. And 79 kept growing. It got around the, the how our became like they were worried about me mowing the lawn uh, because I'd get up there and have to turn around and that traffic was so heavy and the big trucks coming through, they were afraid that I would get run over. Yeah. Uh, but that property, that was what we sold that for about to build this. So you're, you're 97? I'm 96. I'm, 96. Yeah, May 12th, I'll be. I won't I'm be very there. close to that. So... You're remarkably, you you look great. I mean, you what know, do you attribute this to? You know, I really don't. I never drank and I never smoked. He just uh, has pretty wives. He just has pretty wives. <laughs> oh, that's probably it. Yeah. Uh, Nothing like patting yourself on the back. Is. But I can remember when I was 90 and I had retired, but I'm out uh, selling insulation at homes all over Ohio. And at 90 years old, I, I remember thinking, you know, I shouldn't be feeling this good. I'm, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to live to be 120 years old. And uh, I'd be up, like one time I'm in this house, I'm up on a ladder up in this guy's attic. I'm explaining what he needs for insulation. I said, come on over here and I'll show you. Oh, I, I'm 75 years old. I can't get up there. Huh? And so at any rate, that was, uh, but I, for some I reason, I never smoked, <laughs> never drank. So I really lived a healthy life and uh, it, it, I just didn't have any problems. So when did you stop working? I, <laughs> Actually, probably when we built this house, because I kept doing something all the time. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking time to talk with us well, about this, so uh, about your experience. 